you need to know that God loves you. Get ready. Today's show is going to bring you hope. Well, hello and welcome to the Strong Tower Mental Health Podcast. I am your host, Heidi Mortensen, licensed marriage and family therapist. And I am really excited to have with me Kim Moss. Um, I actually was very, was started listening to her last summer and wanted to interview her. And then lo and behold, I get her book in the mail. Um, so we're going to be talking about her book um, called Finding Our Muchness. But I'd love to get to know you a little bit more, Kim. Can you talk about who you are and um, how you're even in ministry and what God has done in your life? Sure. And it's so nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. And uh, I'm so excited about my new book. Um, mm -hmm. I am, well... I used to always call myself the mom from Moorpark, and uh, that's where <laughs> I—that's where I uh, received my calling, actually, and raised my children. And uh, my children got married, started having grandchildren, all of that. And uh, but now I'm in Idaho, so I guess I can't call myself the mom from Moorpark anymore. Um, where is Moorpark? Oh, more parks in, in Southern California, in Ventura okay. County. Yeah, Southern okay. California. But now I live in North Idaho okay. uh, near Coeur d'Alene. Yeah. Oh, very and, cool. Yeah, it's beautiful. I live in a little forest and uh, it's great. So I, um, I'm a mom and I'm a grandmother and I'm a wife of 43 years. And uh, my grandchildren are, you know, they're starting to get to driving age. So that's where we're at in life. And uh, I've been a minister for 30 years and uh, I'm ordained, of course, all that. And um, I have my own nonprofit and I travel the world and speak and preach and prophesy. And that's what God said to me on March 22nd, 1994. But I got to tell you, it was a complete shock to me because as my husband and I would say, uh, it never was a dream of mine. <laughs> and but I I discovered that it was God's dream for my life. And um and when I even though I was shocked when I stepped into that, I there has been nothing more thrilling and fulfilling and satisfying than than doing really fulfilling the purpose for which I was created. And mm -hmm. um, but it didn't start out that way. You know, I grew up, I grew up in a family that was a Christian and mm -hmm. we went to church, but on and off sporadically, because my parents worked very, very hard. And um, and so sometimes they were just simply tired on Sundays, you know. And mm -hmm. when I was 13, I got saved and it was a beautiful moment in my life. And I my heart burned for Jesus and I knew I wanted him so much. And I was in a church context that really didn't uh, adhere to women in ministry, you know, mm -hmm. or to the things of the Holy Spirit. Um, but during that time when I got when I received salvation, we did altar calls. And so I had to go forward in front of several hundred people uh, to acknowledge that I really wanted Jesus. But I, um, I mean, during that moment, my heart was just burning. I had to go. I just felt compelled. But then, you know, I started living my life and I didn't really feel like I had the strength to fight everything that was happening in my teen years. And so I fell away from the mm -hmm. Lord, you know, that typical story, you know, yep. of that I wish it wasn't like that. I wish I had a different kind of a story, but yeah, I have that story. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it wasn't that I was bad or anything, but I wasn't, I didn't read my Bible. I didn't go to church. I didn't hang with Christian friends. And, you know, so I had boyfriends and partied, you know, and nothing, nothing very serious, but, you know, a little bit of dabbling here and there. And then um, I went through a very difficult time in my life when I actually uh, was engaged to be married. And um, I found my fiance uh, just weeks before my wedding day um, in bed with another girl. And so the wedding had to be called off. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I actually fell into a very deep depression and I went through, at that time, they called it a nervous breakdown. I think we call it different things now. You would know that better than I would. Um, but um, I, for a year, I was in a very, very dark place and I just could not pull out of it. And my parents were extremely worried and they tried to do everything. Doctors put me on medication. It didn't really help. And I just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried and cried because I was convinced that it was me, that I... I wasn't pretty enough. 
I wasn't funny enough. I wasn't smart enough. I was, I just wasn't enough. I just wasn't good enough. Right. And so this is why this happened to me. And it, it's interesting, isn't it? That I didn't blame it all on him. I, I blamed it all on me, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so I, so I went through that dark time and then that's when I met my husband <laughs> mm. and, and, and my husband, I saw such good things in him, you know, but we, we met on a blind date and I was sure I was in love with him after two weeks. And within a few months, uh, I was pregnant. We got engaged and we got married and that's how that went. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and a few weeks, I mean, literally a few weeks after we were married, I realized that my husband was a drug addict and an alcoholic, though I knew he oh. was a non-believer, you know, oh. um, but I wasn't living like a believer. So why would I date believers, right. you know, and I exactly. was on the tail end of this really bad place, dark, dark season in my life. So I had no self-worth or anything like that. So, yes. um, so I married him and it was bad and, uh, two children and three, almost four years later, I filed for divorce. I left, um, he was in a bad place and, uh, he didn't pay child support. I worked two jobs, had one month, uh, one Sunday, a month off of my job. And, um, and it was in that time I met this woman who was a pastor that her and her husband were, were, uh, they were planting a vineyard church. I didn't know what that meant because I didn't grow up with any kind of charismatic anything. Yep. You know, I I thought there were two. I thought there were two denominations. I thought yep. there were Catholics because of our best friends across the street, and I thought there were Baptists because that's how oh. I was raised. Okay, yep. that's. I didn't know there was anything else. I didn't yep. know anything about the Holy Spirit. You know. Yep. And, um, so she, I told her all the ugly things and she was so kind to me and invited me to be part of their church. So <laughs> I was like, I'm the biggest sinner in the world. I just told you all the things that I've done. You know, I just mm -hmm. told you all the, all the bad. I mean, I'm now, now, because now after I left my husband, now I'm doing uh, lots of bad things, but I'm trying to raise my two children. I'm working all the time. It was bad, 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 ugly, ugly. And so I start going to their church and a couple of weeks into it, I buy myself a Bible because I thought, well, if I'm going to start to go to church, I should read scripture. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. And I'm sitting in my uh, in my apartment. My girls are asleep in the back room. And I open up my Bible and I hear the audible voice of God. Now, you have to understand, I was not expecting it. I didn't pursue it. I didn't know it could happen. Mm. I had no context for this. Okay. But it was loud outside, inside. I heard actual wow. words. I knew, you know, and I knew it was God. There was no escaping it. And um, it scared me to death because it is terrifying and thrilling at the same time. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got over my shock and my fear, then I was angry and I just started yelling at him. You know, I stood up and yelling at him. I do I even understand what you are saying to me. You know, do you understand what I have been through? Do you know what you are asking me to do? You know, but um, in that moment, I knew that um, I was either going to follow the Lord for the rest of my life or I was going to not follow the Lord for the rest of my life. It was one of those line in the sands kind of times. Yeah. What did what did you hear? <laughs> I heard go home and I will take care of everything. That was it. That was it. Wow. He never said another thing. I knew I had to make a choice. So I went to the phone. I picked up the phone. I, I called my husband. God. I asked him for a date. He was like, oh. who is this? You know, <laughs> we were three weeks before our divorce was final. We oh. had not <laughs> sit, sat in the same room for six months. And oh it, had been, it had been ugly. There had been fights over the children, stealing oh, the children guess. there. It, was, yeah. it had been ugly, 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 ugly. And uh, so we met for dinner and I went home that weekend. And uh, a month later, I was pregnant with our third child. And my family is like, what are you doing? He has not changed. What are you doing? Our right. beautiful, smart daughter, what are you doing? Because you thought it was hard with two. What are you going to do when it happens again right. with three? You know? Yeah. And um, and but I had this word. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I so I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible. He's not really changed. And um, and uh it was four years later. So, you know, just, just a note on that. When I give my public testimony, when I really like preach my testimony, I, yeah. I say this, and I want to say this for who's ever listening, because I'm feeling the Holy Spirit right now. But um, sometimes we get a prophetic word, we hear God's voice, and it's absolutely the Lord, but it takes time 
for that word to come to pass. And you go through a serious testing. You know, it's not always instantaneous, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm calling you to the nations, you know, and then bam, <laughs> you're there, you know, you have, you go through a time when you prove yourself faithful and you have to, you have to wait through the testing. And I was sorely tested for four years at the end of four years. I was at the end of my rope. He'd been gone all night drinking. I was up all night praying, telling the Lord, I can't, I can't do it one more day. I've gone in the strength of this word for four years. I just, you know, and he came in in the morning and he said he had had an experience and this is a much longer story, but we have other things to talk about. But so I'm just going to no, say, this is good. Yeah. He told me that, um, that on his way home, uh, after doing drugs and alcohol all night long with his friends, um, a presence filled the car and he knew it was Jesus. And he heard a, a voice on the inside saying, if you, if, uh, uh, you're about to lose everything that you've ever loved unless you, and I won't bring it back this time, unless you give your life into my hands. Oh. And, um, and so he gave his life to Jesus and he was instantly delivered from all of his drugs and alcohol. Oh. Instant, instantly, he was completely changed. We began to heal as a family and live like Christians. Oh. We found a church together. We started oh. going to a four square church. We didn't know what that was either. <laughs> So, I mean, God is tricky, man. You know, yes. he's just tricky. He just leads you, you know, when you don't even know what you're doing. And right. uh, we go start going to this four square church. It was very seeker sensitive. That's why we, you know, it was like we're comfortable there because I was a Baptist, though I'd heard the voice of God, but I never heard again. So it's not like all of a sudden I'm hearing and I'm yep. full of the Holy Spirit. No, no. Yep. I heard the voice of God. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so we're in this four square church and we're healing and my husband was a fireman. I was a labor and delivery nurse. We were doing good. My kids are starting to grow. We're starting to thrive as a family. And someone mm -hmm. heard my testimony. They asked me to come to a women's retreat, give my testimony. Well, I didn't really like women's ministry because because uh, I thought it was really lame at the time. I think it's getting much better now. And um, I'm just being a little honest there. And, um, <laughs> yeah. and so I go to the women's retreat, never been to one before. I gave my testimony. And of course, there's not a dry eye in the room because, you know, I mean, I've been through it, man. Mm -hmm. And there's a, this a story is a very long story. And, um, and a young girl, so I'm in my thirties. I think I'm 34 at the time. A young mm -hmm. girl about 20, she just got back from Rama Bible college in, in the mm -hmm. South, which is, which was a word of faith, uh, Holy Spirit you know, yeah. uh, Jerry Savelle, right. I think Jerry yeah. Savelle just passed away because, yeah. you know, and, um, anyway, she says, Kim, I feel like the Lord wants me to lay hands on you for the baptism of the Holy spirit, but aren't you already baptized with the Holy spirit? You know, <laughs> cause I'd heard the voice of God. Right. I said, yeah. well, you can try. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I meant it. Like I, I, I was still Baptist in a Pentecostal church, Yeah, mm -hmm. but I'd had this experience. I knew something. Yeah. God had something. There was something more, right? And so I'm like, well, you can try because I don't know if that's going to work for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, she laid hands on me. Oh, Lord Jesus. I had a radical, and I, I say that in my bio because it was a radical encounter. Like I went home a different woman. I Come was on. filled with the Holy Spirit, sobbing, mm -hmm. weeping. I got the gift of tongues the next day. Mm -hmm. I heard, started hearing God's voice. I didn't even recognize that I'm hearing God's voice. We take communion and God says, um, you know, I'm calling you to full-time ministry. I'm, you're going to be a waterer. That's what he called me, a waterer. I'm going to take you around the world to preach and speak and prophesy. I am like, I am the mom from Moore Park. What are you talking about? <laughs> I have three small children. I'm a nurse. My husband is not going to know what to do with this. I And I start telling, and I have done every bad thing. Now I'm recounting every bad thing. Isn't that what we do as women? Because mm -hmm. see, we carry around the shame for far too long, right? It's like, yeah. oh yeah, okay. Um, God, you're accepting me, but I, but you're accepting mm -hmm. me, even though I have to still, I have to still hate myself and think I'm bad. Right. I yes. still have to, I have to remind myself that I, I am full of shame and I deserve, yes. I don't have any worth. Right. And yes. so I'm sobbing and I'm telling him this. And he says, you see that woman over there with the blonde hair? I want you to go tell her what you just told me. I, I didn't know who she was. I didn't even recognize I'm hearing God's voice. I go over cause I'm just obedient, you know, mm -hmm. and I go over and I say, Okay, God just called me a full-time ministry. I can't because I'm bad. I have, a, I've done all these bad things. She looks at me. She looks right through me. She purses her lips like this as she says, you spirit of, I never heard another word because I am jerking 
My head is flipping back and forth. My body is <laughs> contorting. I don't know what is happening. I am drooling. I am I am sobbing. Snot is coming uh -huh. from my nose. I am <laughs> and I'm going through deliverance. I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. Right. I mean, I even and I'm like, I didn't even hear what it was. She called off of me, but I felt something lift, right? And then uh, I run out oh, of the room. On. I'm sobbing. Come on. It's like he says, he starts talking to me like crazy, you know. I go home. My husband's like, you are scaring me. Who are you? Right. Like what happened to my wife? Yeah. And ever since then, I am compelled mm. to do whatever God says. I, I so believe that he is real. I so know that when he speaks to you, it is real. I am so bold to take a risk. And I'm not saying that I didn't have to go through growing stages because I did, you know, I'm, I am 65 turning 65. So I, I've been doing this now for 30 years. Okay. So I understand, you know, I, I I've been through a process and I could tell you story after story after story, but it was soon after that, that, um, that I started, then he started, took me to school. You know, I started getting called out like Cindy Jacobs. Once I'm with 2000 women at a conference, I'm sitting way in the back. She calls me out and she prophesies over me. You're a revivalist to the nations. You're going to go around the world and speak and preach and prophesy. And I'm on the ground. Cause I'm like, <laughs> and my friends were with me. Cause they've been see, watching this happen over the last few years. You know, and they're like, Kim, yes. she just said everything you heard. Yes. I'm like, I know it's freaking me out. It's yeah. freaking me out, you know? So, so that's who I, wanna, I am. I want to just, yeah, I want to just make a comment here because I feel that there's some people listening that things are happening in your body and you don't really understand what's happening. And I'm not saying that you're falling on the floor or whatever, but I feel like some of you even have like tingles in your arms and you, you can feel something happening and just yield it, yield to it and just say, yes, God, I say yes to you. God is pursuing you. God is doing something. This is where like, I love your testimony because you're speaking so authentically with like, I don't even know what's happening. I mean, this feels very similar to me. Cause I'm like, I don't know. How am I here on this podcast and doing this? I don't even understand. Like, but God is doing what God is doing. And I just say yes to it. So if you are listening and you can sense God doing something within you, just say yes to him. Say yes. Teach me, God. You do not need to go to Bible school or be an expert in anything. The Holy Spirit will lead you. Just say yes. So thank you. I just, you can, you can keep going. I want to hear about your, I want to hear about your book now, but this has been, okay. your testimony is amazing. Thank you. I, I, yeah. you know, I really, no lie, no kidding. I was just an ordinary girl. I really, yes. and, and, and that's why I wrote this book. I mean, really, because women in scripture, they're just ordinary women, yes. you know, with all their flaws, yes. all wrong. You know, you think yep. you're all wrong. I'm all wrong. I'm not enough. I can't do this. I don't have right. the gifting. I don't have the money. I don't have yep. the education. I'm too skinny. I'm too fat. I'm too mm -hmm. small. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too, all of the things that the enemy mm -hmm. pours into our mind and that we say to ourselves all the time, I've done too many bad things. I'm yeah. not the right ethnicity. I'm not the right, I'm, I'm not the right anything, you know, yeah. um, but God is the right everything. And when he comes into your life and he fills mm. you with the Holy Spirit, mm. your only responsibility is to say, God, have your way. Like Mary, right? When, when, when he, she's going to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and yeah. she's going to be filled with the divine, with the sacred, and she's going to bring forth a life that's going to change the world. Listen, women of God, this is exactly what God wants to do with your life right now now. So I wrote the book. <laughs> so I wrote the book and, um, you don't have to, you don't have to live with shame. I think I start the book out. I think in the introduction, I say something like when I was young, I didn't know that I was powerful and I didn't know that I could change my world. And, um, and I, and I really did not. And I really did not know. I really thought that I had to live with all of that. I thought, you know, in my, in the generation before me, my mother's generation, they used to say to their children, well, you made your bed. Now you have to lie in it. Yeah. And I really thought that that was true. Mm -hmm. I thought that 
all the things that I did that I regretted, though, though the Lord forgave me that I still had to carry them around as a badge of shame so yeah. that people would know how bad I was because I hadn't obeyed from the beginning, you know, right. but that's not what Jesus says. That's not what scripture says, you know, and, and you find that. So finding mm -hmm. our muchness is really about, uh, I wrote the book <laughs> when chosen asked me to write the book, I was like, I, I don't know if you want, you know, and then I, and then I felt like the Lord said, yeah, you're going to write this book. Cause it really is. My heart is wrapped up in this book. Um, mm -hmm. Wow. I'm going to cry um, because my life, my life is much like the lives of the women in scripture. And you're going to find, if you write, read this book, your life is much like the lives of these women in the scripture. They didn't start out great. Right. They started out as just a girl, yeah. you know, and then they, then they meet the God of all creation, the God of everything that, that is impossible. And they're like me, you know, they come up against a prophetic word or, or God, or God encounter. And they go, wait a minute, I'm just a girl. I can't do this. And doesn't scripture say that I can't do this? And doesn't society say that I'm not big enough to do this? And doesn't, doesn't my family say that I'm too small to do this? And doesn't, and doesn't the abuse that I've had in my background tell me that I have no worth and value and I can't do this? Doesn't all these, and, mm. and God is saying, mm. you're right. You can't do this. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to fake it, work it, think it, make it happen in your mm -hmm. own strength. And that's the point. The point is that you are only human, but you, we don't measure what God can do with your life by human standards. We're measuring it by God. And God came to Sarah, who was barren and her husband had this huge prophecy over the family and she can't perform because she's a barren woman, you know? Yes. But yeah. it was her experience, not her identity. Yeah. And God is going to show her, this is not your identity. Listen, there's nothing yeah. that's impossible for me. And I am going to use every human limitation that you face. I am going to use every flaw in your life. I am going to use every place where you're, you have been, you have been dem in demonic bondage. I'm going to set you free where you have been, where you have sinned. I'm going to forgive you. And I'm going to use every one of these Things that have happened in your life, all your experiences, all of your history, all of your personality. And I'm going to use also the gifts and the talent and the muchness. You know, that word muchness is me'od in the Hebrew. It mm -hmm. comes from, it comes from the Shema where G, where the Lord says, I am the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God is one. Oh, oh, Israel, uh, the Lord, your God is one. You are mm -hmm. to love your Lord, the Lord, your God with all your heart with all of your soul and with all of your me'od, very, very much, mm. your muchness. You're going to love, and he's put it in you. This is the point, you see, because he's going to get the glory from your life. He's mm -hmm. going to take this ordinary girl who's been trashed around, thrashed around and, and broken and damaged and abused and misused and, and misunderstood. And I've hated myself. I have, mm -hmm. I have done things that I regretted and he's mm -hmm. going to clean all that up and he's going to come upon me. He's going to use me. He's going to use my life. He's going to send me out to do what is impossible for me to do. Cold, cold. I know where I come from. Impossible for me to do. And he gets all the glory. And that's the point. Hmm. So muchness is a, is a book that is so important to me for women. I think what I, what I learned about the lives of the women as I wrote about them, I, you know, this book is not the stories of these women in the normal way that they're usually told. I think that you will be surprised when you read some of the stories of these women. I think you will be surprised at how the Holy Spirit is mm -hmm. highlighting these women for a reason. You know, I, I've been in church for years and years and years. I've been in ministry for 30 years, you know, and, um, and I love hearing the the sermons that come out of the lives of the stories of men in the scripture but i think that we have been remiss in some in many ways that there are 52 weeks in a year and we hear usually a sermon out of the stories of a woman on mm -hmm. mother's day and christmas 
Mm -hmm. You know, Mother's Day will be Proverbs 31. I usually walk out feeling like I just am never going to measure up. And you know, the Proverbs 31 passage of scripture is not for that reason. Proverbs 31 is the, is the scripture that shows us that as the bride of Christ, male and female, but especially we women who look at this, that we can do anything. She is a businesswoman. She buys property. She manages her household. She has authority. She leads. She does. Mm -hmm. And so it's really... It's really an add a girl. You can do it, whatever God has called you to do. It's not <laughs> hold it up here. And how come you haven't done yeah. this? You haven't measured up to this. You, it's not like that. Yeah. And um, that's not how God, the Holy Spirit wants it used in your life. And it's the same with these women mm -hmm. in the scripture, chapter after chapter after chapter, the Holy Spirit is highlighting, you know, that, that you that God has given you muchness so you can rise out of your circumstances. You can rise out from under the limitations that have been placed on you that God did not place on you. You can rise out of the ashes of your life and the broken pieces of your life to fulfill the purpose for which you created. And he mm -hmm. has given you muchness. But when we go through some of these times, right, like all the things that I described to you, when I went through that, that horrible depression for a year. I couldn't even leave my room. It was mm. so bad. I, I sat in the dark for hours and hours and hours and I would rock and cry. And my parents, mm. they were like, Do, are we going to have to put her in some kind of institution? You know, it was that bad. It was yeah. bad. And, um, and I was only 19, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to pull out of that, you know, and I had, I was grieving and I was, I was falling into a time where I just hated myself, you know, but God has given me muchness. And because of what I'd been through, I lost it. I didn't know it was still there. That God, that God was just waiting there for me to, to come to him, let him take that from me, heal me, you know, yeah. and give me back my muchness. So that muchness, that very, very much is what it actually is. It's your, it's your strength and boldness. It's your, it's the confidence, not, not self-confidence. You know, that the world says, yeah, have self confidence pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's not that. It isn't yeah. that. It's the confidence of Hebrews 1035, where it says, never throw away your confidence. You know, it has a rich reward. That confidence yeah. actually in the Greek, it means your bold, believing, trusting God that then issues forth in your speaking prophetically about your life and about who God is and what he has said. That's what that word means. And so that's the kind of confidence God wants you to have. It's your, it's your essence. It's your wisdom. It's your cunning. It's your, it's your essence. It's that strength that's inside you. And, and, um, and when we go through these things, it gets lost in that confusion. And I wrote the book, I wrote the book, finding our muchness because it's time for us to find our muchness. We, oh, we have to take it back. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I see so many women like operating from that place, like you said, of like the self-hate and like, we're not good enough. And we live kind of in this past. I love how in the story of Sarah, you actually talked about hey, um, Hagar, right? Yeah. Am I saying that right? And how yeah. just kind of this place of, of slavery where we like live in the old life, we live in the old thing. And yeah. you really are kind of calling us to like throw that out and, and yeah. rise up to what God actually intends for us. Can you share a little bit of the story of how you came up with the name? Because it actually comes from Alice in Wonderland. Also, yeah. I know that that's, <laughs> it uh, does. I love, I love it. I love. I love how you end the book too, where you kind of talk about that that scene at the end, and it just really kind of brings it all together. So, can you talk about how you came up with the name? I oh, I would love to. I'm so that you. I'm so glad that you asked me that. Um, well, I fell in love with this movie, Alice in Wonderland from 2010 and Johnny Depp st stars in it. And, you know, it is not like um, the greatest cinematic movie ever made, but I was captivated uh, by the, I, I'm very prophetic. And so I was captivated by the prophetic, uh, by the prophetic import of this movie for women and mm -hmm. how it prophesied what I was prophesying all over the world that mm -hmm. I saw a women's movement coming because mm -hmm. on the forefront of every revival movement, women are raised up. And I mm -hmm. saw that there was a movement coming and that within that movement, there was going to be another movement of women. And so mm -hmm. I go see this movie in 2010, right? And I, I love Alice in Wonderland anyway, because I love fantasy sci-fi. That's my gig. I'm, <laughs> I'm very much a nerd. I'm, I'm such a nerd. And, um, <laughs> and I go see this movie and I cannot believe 
the things that they are saying in this movie. Cause I know like, it's, this is not a Christian movie, you know, but it was so prophetic. So Alice has grown up. She is now 19 years old and, um, and it was six, it was, uh, she was six years old. So 13 years or earlier was when the Lewis Carroll one is a take on the Lewis Carroll story of, you know, and when she had fallen down the rabbit hole and experienced wonderland. So now she's 19, her father has died. Now get this prophetically, her father, our father. Okay. So Ooh. it's with her father that she has dreamed the impossible dreams. And they've mm -hmm. talked about it again and again and again. And she's so close with her father and he's her champion. And she talks about how, why my father and I used to dream of six impossible things even before breakfast. And of course, that's a tagline from the earlier time in her life when the Red Queen says that to her. Oh, my Alice, you sure are out of practice. Why I, I practice, you know, and so, but she, this has transferred to her and her father. And so her father dies and she has forgotten who she is. She loses her identity in the tragedy of losing this relationship in her life. Well, in that culture, you see, um, girls were not as valuable as boys because you had to pay for a girl. And so she is now a burden to her family. And so her mother is trying to get her married to someone who can care for her and has money and all of that. And so it be, is not a burden to the family, you know, this and that and the other thing, you know, and it's not that her mother doesn't love her okay but her mother feels forced by society to do mm -hmm. this thing that is the cultural norm right. for her day. Right. okay yeah so you see her she's she's dancing at a party and she's meeting her fiance for the first time and she's very dreamy she's very dreamer and i'm so visionary okay and so she's she's off in space and he says what are you doing you know and she says why i just had a vision and he says well you know you should keep your visions to yourself and when in doubt remain silent isn't this what the devil says to us? You see, our totally. father has dreams for us. Come we go on. through tragedies in life and we forget who we are. And then the devil comes and says to us, you should keep your visions to yourself. And when in doubt, remain silent. I mean, I mean, listen, I am like, I am flipping out <laughs> watching this movie, like flipping out watching this movie. Okay. So then she goes on. So she's confused. She doesn't know what to do. Like, this is not what she, she's like, I'm feeling trapped by this. And she has all the, she ends up falling down the hole again. And she finds herself in wonderland and she's too big and she's too, or she's too small. She's not the right. And they drag her before Absalom, the absolute the blue caterpillars, the absolute. What do you think that the prophet? Okay. And he's like, and they say, Absalom, tell us who the who she is. You know, isn't is this Alice or isn't she? Because she keeps saying, I'm not that Alice. Because they're like, You're the champion of Underland. I'm not that Alice. Tell us who is she? And he says, Who are you? And she says, Who am I? And he says, He says, He says, I'm abs she says, Absalom. And he says, I'm Absalom, but who are you? And she says, I'm Alice. And he says, we shall see. And she says, and she says, what do you mean? I ought to know who I am. And he says, yes, you ought, stupid girl. You know, and so he says, unroll the oraculum. Now, the oraculum is the prophetic scroll that shows each and every day what happens in the future, in the past and the future. I mean, come on. OK, this prophetic. And so they show her the fraptious day. It's a day where she is standing in full armor. She has a sword over her head and she's slaying the Jabberwocky, the dragon. Hello, scripture. Hello. The dragon that has terrorized Wonderland. OK, and she backs up and she says, I'm not that Alice. You know, and everyone around her is screaming at her imposter. You should be ashamed, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so she becomes not hardly Alice. OK, uh, so the, the story goes along. Story goes along. And now she meets the Mad Hatter, you know, and all along. It's like, I'm not that Alice. I'm not that Alice. I, I'm not Harley <laughs> Alice. You know, it's, it's a crazy story. She meets the Mad Hatter and the Mad Hatter is so happy to see her. And he and he uh, they're walking together on this road and and the scene. I mean, it is so prophetic all around is devastation everywhere. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. lands are burned up. The lands are barren. There is no life. I mean, what does the devil come and do? 
And he steals, kills, and destroys. You know, he yeah. brings no life. There's death yeah. everywhere the devil goes, right? Absolutely. And there's no life. And he starts he starts reciting the poem that's in the Lewis Carroll book of Alice in the Wonderland about yeah. uh, Alice slaying the Jabberwocky. And he says, this is about you, you know. And she says, no, it's not. I'm not that Alice. I'm, I, I am not slaying anything. And this is where it happens. He looks at her and he says, you don't slay. You don't slay. And he points his finger to her guts right in the middle. And he, and he, and he, and he pokes her belly and he says, something in here, something is missing. You used to be much more muchier. You've lost your muchness. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I am like, from that moment on, I am like, I mean, do you see what has happened? She's gone through a tragedy in a time when her father has dreams for her. And she says at the end, my father had a dream and he never let anyone stop him. And this is our God. You know, he has dreams, but she's gone through tragedy. And so she forgets who she is. And then she becomes not hardly herself, a false, a false version of who she really is, you know, mm -hmm. and then the Mad Hatter names it. You've lost your muchness. And so when I saw that, when I heard that, and I knew that in scripture, God gives us muchness, our very, very much strength. I was like, this has got to be the name of this book. Mm -hmm. You know, find Absolutely. it's time for us to find our muchness, something yeah. in there. This is so good. And we're we're getting close to the end. I want you to pray for us. But okay. I you write in the book though that the just what you said here, that it is in the dead places that God brings revival. So yeah. How do you see this in our culture today? <laughs> oh my goodness. We uh we are in a strategic Proph moment. Prophesy, in give us some encouragement. Yeah. <laughs> we are in a yeah, we are in a strategic moment in history right now. And in every strategic moment, uh God begins to move. You know, I the last book that I wrote was about the move that I saw coming. And uh, because God said, God said to me that the church was going to make a comeback. And I'm like, Lord, it doesn't look like it. It looks dead, you know, but listen, there can't be a revival unless something's dead because the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, definition of revival is the coming back to life of something that's dead. You can't have a miracle unless there's an impossible situation. You can't have a healing unless there's a sickness, right? You can't have, you can't have these things happen unless there's something going on that, that seems like uh, it's an impossible situation. And what we see going on right now in our nation, I mean, in nations around the world, listen, we've been through a pandemic. We've been through all this nonsense with false prophecy. We've seen all of these crazy things. And people think, well, the church is, is down for the count. Well, let me tell you, the church is never down for the count because it belongs to Jesus. And Jesus mm -hmm. is never down for the count. And Jesus is not up on high going, oh my God, I don't know what to do about that situation. Oh no, he has a, he has has a word and he has a will and he has a agenda yeah. for our time. And so revival is coming. I think personally that revival started with the pandemic because the pandemic showed us that our, our entertainment can't hide where we are anymore. We can't cover it up anymore. People are trying to cope with the unprecedented range, rate of change going on in our nation and going on in the world right now. They don't know how to cope. cope. So they are turning to, they're turning to drugs. They're turning to entertainment. They're turning to all these things to keep themselves numb so that they don't have to face it. But it ripped it all off because we couldn't go shopping anymore. We couldn't go to the movies anymore. We couldn't go out to dinner anymore. We couldn't do anything anymore, but stay home with our kids and see where our family's at, where our marriages are at, where my life is at, how unhappy that I really am, how I'm not really following God anymore. I've just been covering up with all of these things. And then for the rest of the world, you know, we found out, didn't we, especially the non-believers in the world who are not saved, they found out that their money can't save them, their doctor can't save them, that their government can't save them. Everything is failing. Who is going to save us? Well, Jesus is the only one that saves, and it was a setup for revival. We are ripe for Mine. revival right now. Mine. The fields are ripe for harvest. And because of that, at every time God begins to move, we see Matthew eleven twelve 12, that says from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And what I discovered in that 
in that passage, which I wrote a whole book about, was that it's a pattern from Genesis until Revelation that we see every time that God begins to move, there is a violent reaction wow. from the enemy that comes in like a flood. And that's when the church begins to rise up and we fight the fight that Jesus fight. But how does he fight? Mm. He doesn't fight with the weapons of the world, people. We have mm. to stop that. You know how he <laughs> fights? Violent mercy, violent grace, violent mm. forgiveness, violent worship, violent intercession, violent mm. generosity. How about violent forgiveness? I mean, mm. when did we forget that we are supposed to even love our enemies? Listen, go to the love passages, read a few of them, go to go to the Sermon on the Mount, read a little bit about that, and you're going to see, oh yeah, that's how the church is supposed to behave. And when we do that, because God is coming right now, now I am prophesying to you because I prophesied this all over the world. Right now, God is dealing with the church. It's not for punishment. It's not for condemnation, but it's so that we can be cleansed because there is a harvest that needs to come in and then be discipled. And if we are not cleansed, we are just going to mess up our discipleship. And these people right. coming in are going to be abused and they're going to be used and they're going to leave the church and they're not going to be the powerful ones that God is asking us to raise up in this time. So he's coming to deal with three specific things in the church right now. And we're already seeing it happen. It's been happening for the last mm -hmm. uh, few years, probably, but it's still a now word. And that is, he's coming to deal with our, with our Jezebel spirit. Now, when we say that people that, you know, so many, the old Pentecostals go, oh, it's a spirit. It's a demon. No, it's a demon that creates a system in the church that, that accepts sexual immorality and false prophecy. And we are seeing that exposed right now in many um, different ways, because God says that can't stay in the yeah. church. Then he's dealing with our idolatry. We find that in the book of Gideon. When you see it in the book of Gideon, you go, oh, see the prophet comes and he says, you know, you forgot who really saves. You forgot whose hand is powerful and you have succumbed to fear of all of these things in your culture and you've fallen into idolatry. So you are worshiping the same idols as the nations. You are working harder because if I make more money, that's going to save me. Or I'm, I'm, I'm sexually gratifying myself even in these ways that are sin because it helps me cope with what's going on in the world. Or we, or we, I'm going to climb the corporate ladder and I'm going to do un underhanded things to do that so that I can gain more power. Listen, these are all idolatrous things and many, many, more that we instead of going to God for the things that we need we mm -hmm. we we raise ourselves up because we're afraid God's not really enough he's not going to really come through he's not who he said he was and we lose our faith and that's called apostasy idolatry mm -hmm. leads to apostasy mm -hmm. and so that's the state of the nation when Gideon is raised up because for Gideon he represents the next generation you see and what has happened is that the testimony of the fathers because they're steeped in idolatry they're just stories we know, you know, because you've been to Bethel and I love how they say, listen, there is power in the testimony. When we give a testimony, it's supposed to be powerful and say, if God did it for me, he can do it for you too. But see, if I'm living a life, that is full of idolatry. I'm not really following Jesus. I'm doing all these things that are compromised with the culture. Listen, then my kids and my generation and all those, the next generation that's looking to me, they're like, that's just stories. She doesn't worship the God of power, you know, and so it has compromised our testimony. God is coming to cleanse that away from us so that our testimony can be powerful again for the next generation, because we're supposed to have intergenerational ministry and we're supposed to be raising up the next generation of leaders right now. The third thing he's coming to deal with is is. He's coming to deal with our religious spirit. And again, yes, it is a demon, but it creates a system in the church where we forget that we were once sinners. And when the sinners come into the church, we sort of sit back and we judge them and we go, oh, wow, yeah. you know, they're dirty. I mean, this happened in Wimber's day, right? I mean, all the all the hippies were coming into the church and his elders left the church of, mm. uh, of Chuck Smith's church because they said right. they're dirtying the carpet with their with their bare feet. And mm. Chuck was like, well, then just tear out the carpet because it's about <laughs> people, you know. Yeah, and so absolutely. and so this is a whole message and I can't go into it any further. But but we but we God is going to restore the heart of worship because our religious spirit has caused us to be blind. We are blinded by our religious spirit and we can't see what God is really doing when we yeah. are blinded with those who are outcasts. Listen, I mean, yeah. listen, what are you going to do when the man in the dress comes to your church, but he's looking for Jesus? Mm -hmm. Are you going to sit back and go, oh man, you know, he, yeah. oh, he, no, they don't get cleaned up until after they receive Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. And you were once in need of cleaning too.
you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. But how does that go with this? Well, within this move of God is going to be a move of women. And I am seeing all over the world already women who are hungry, young women who are looking to women like me who have experience. They need spiritual mothers, you know, yeah. and they need to be taught how to walk in the Holy Spirit, how to how to navigate this thing called calling because yeah. there's a great cost, right? We know there's a great cost, but the cost is worth the call. Let me tell you, because you, you're going to see things you never thought you were going to see. So God is raising up women all over the world, and you are part of that great company. Psalm 20, 68, 11 says, the word of the Lord went out and great was the company of the women that proclaimed it. You know, we are all called to fulfill the great commission. We are all part of the royal priesthood. We are, are throughout this book, what you're going to find is that you have permission from God to answer the call of God. And when I say calling, don't get hooked up on that word. Don't get caught up on that word. Just realize that means the purpose for which you were created. There are women who are being called right now. Listen, you listening to me right now. I'm telling you, some of you know this already, but you're being called to preach in the nations, but you, but you don't know how that's going to happen. And you haven't said yes to that call. Some of you, you know, you have a book to write and you've been afraid because, oh, there's so many books out there. Why do I have to write my book? Oh yeah. I said the same thing. Listen, when God asks you to do it, you just yield to the call. You need to say yes. Some of you are going to be called to reform the healthcare system. Some of you are going to be called to reform the educational system. Some of you are going to be called to reform the child protective services because that needs reforming in our nation right now. Some of you are going to be called to politics because you have some kind of wisdom and counsel on your life that God wants to use you to be a voice. Some of you just need to take back your voice because you got something to say. Some of you are going to be called to preach and you're not sure because you were raised in a context that said women need to be silent in the church. Mm -hmm. And listen, it's a lie. It's not true. I can give you many books and all of that to, to, to conflate that. But in the last chapter of my book, I tell you all about that. Some of you are, are going to be, some of you are called to the family and the home. And that is a beautiful and a high calling. And don't you let anybody tell you that it's not enough. Some of you are going to be called to teach a class, become a professor. You already have the education, but you're like, oh, I don't know if I, but yeah, you have it in you. It's already in you. Some of you are going to be called to come out of your jobs and get into ministry. And let me tell you, that is a scary thing to be because I had 20 22 years of nursing. I was good at what I did. I thought it was a calling. And then Jesus said, I'm going to take you around the world to preach and teach and prophesy. I'm like, I don't even know how you're going to do that. But listen, I am doing that today. And so if you are being called into that, as we said in the very beginning, you just say yes. It's not going to be your good looks that makes it happen. It's not going to be your ingenuity that makes it happen. It's not going to be your strength and your own talents that's going to make it happen. Good is going to use all that. But you know what it's going to be? It's going to be the Holy Spirit in you because it's not by might and not by power, but by the Holy Spirit, says the Lord. And you will be amazed how he will he will just put things in place. You don't know how it's going to happen, but suddenly you're meeting people and they open a door for you. Suddenly an opportunity opens up for you and you find yourself standing in the middle of a platform saying some things. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Comes right to my mind. Some of you are being called to be advocates and we need advocates for the, for women in every nation. We need advocates for children in every nation. We need advocates for the sex trafficking. We still don't have enough people working on that. There's a lot of people working on that, but we don't have enough people working on that. There are, we need advocates. Advocates, listen, can you hear me? What I'm saying to you is that there are so many needs right now that there is room for each and every one of you. And we need each and every one of you so that God can have his way in this very hour. Should I pray? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I want you to put your hand on your heart and I want you to put your hand on your heart right now. And I want to pray for you. And, you know, uh, I run with uh, Dr. Randy Clark is my friend and everywhere he goes, he releases an impartation and he has taught me to do the same thing. I want to release an impartation for my life to yours. Don't be weirded out about that. All that means is, you know, when Moses was uh, when Moses was overworked and all that, and God said, gather the elders, I'm going to take some of the spirit that's on you and I'm going to put it on them. And it was the first impartation. Paul said, I wish I was with you so I could lay hands on you and release to you an impartation. And so I'm going to, I'm, and so it's biblical. Okay, but I'm going to release you an impartation right here through the screen because it can happen. Let me tell you, I know that it can. So just lay your hand on your heart right now. Father, Holy Spirit, I bid you come right now. 
You are the God that trans, you transcend time. You transcend electronics. You transcend history. You are the God who, who enters our hearts and our minds and you change everything. You are a transformer. You are a reformer. You are a transfigurer. You are the God who, who, uh, who puts us in a strategic time and then makes us ready. Even when we think we're not ready, you are the God who calls us out and then gives us everything we need, all the resources and everything. And you have given me certain, certain, certain kind of gifts, Lord God. And so right now in the name of Jesus, I release over these women who are listening, a transference of anointing, Lord God, some of the spirit that is on me, some of the grace that is on my life, Lord God, some of the, some of the impartation that I can release, Lord God, as a grace right now over these women in Jesus name for leadership. Lord God, for boldness, I am a very bold woman. For a gift of faith, Lord God, I have the gift of faith to believe for miracles, and I see miracles all over the world. For prophecy, Lord God, I prophesy everywhere I go, and I prophesy over you right now that your prophetic gift is going to increase, and you're going to have dreams and visions after this, and you're going to be surprised. And Father, also to be a women leader, Lord God, in the ranks of women leader, Lord God, women leaders from, from the time of Scripture throughout history, even to our time, Lord God. Father, I prophesy over these women, God, that they're going to be abolitionists, Lord God, that they're going to be revivalists, Lord God, that they're going to be apostles and prophets and teachers, Lord God, that they are going to be politicians, Lord God, someone is going to be the president of a, of a brand new nonprofit that you're going to form, Lord God, even in this next year. Some of you are going to be teachers in high school classrooms, and you're going to shape the lives of high school students before they go to college and before they're exposed to even to ideologies and philosophies, and they are going to be able to speak speak prophetically and articulately about those things and they're going to write books and that's going to be part of your legacy. So Father, right now I ask you to stir up the gifts that are over them. I ask Lord God that you would empower them in a fresh way that they would receive a fresh, a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit right now, right now for those Lord God who heard my testimony and Lord, they're going through a deep, dark season right now. First of all, Lord, right now I just hear I just hear that God wants to, he just wants to rebuke right now, a spirit of death and suicide that has come upon you. And so I just take authority over that in the name of Jesus. And I rebuke that spirit that has come upon you that speaks into your mind and whispers into your ear that, that it's never gonna change and that you're never gonna be good enough. And that what you have done is so bad that you don't deserve to live. And that what has been done to you has made you damaged goods. And I'm telling you right now that God says this is not true. That you have value and that you have worth. And that there are gifts and a call that is on your life. And people are waiting for you to rise up so that you can impact their life. And that you are not damaged goods. That that was an experience, but it's not your identity. And he's healing that even right now. And I take authority over a victim mentality that has come upon you because of a demonic thing, because you had an experience of being a victim, but you are not, but that's not your identity. It's only an experience. So Father, go right now and heal that trauma. Heal the trauma in their heart. Heal the trauma in their mind. Heal the body memories that come up in Jesus' name. And I just feel like right now, I just, just the love of Jesus just come over you. Just the love of Jesus, like a liquid love. That you would feel it and that you would be healed. Be healed right now in Jesus' name. Where you feel barren or you actually are barren in your body. I just, I just speak life over you right now in Jesus' name. And I just ask the Holy Spirit to heal your inward parts. That you would feel fertile again and you could receive and conceive and bring forth fresh new life. For some of you, that means an actual child. And so, Father, I'm asking with your, with your great blessing, Lord God, and I'm asking in your mercy, Lord God, would you heal wombs right now? Would you touch them in that place right now, Lord God? Would you heal their heart where they dread even every month, Lord God? where they dread intimacy with their partner because of that, Lord God. I'm asking you to heal that right now in Jesus' name. I speak healing over you. And I just want to tell you if you're listening right now, listen, you are part of the great company of the women God is raising up. 
and it doesn't have to look like anybody else but like you and it will it will you will have your own calling you will have your own gifts you will have your own talents you will have your own sphere of influence and like Deborah she was raised up to the highest level of leadership in politics she was a judge but JL she was raised up in leadership in her tent as a homemaker and both were heralded and both were held up in honor by the Holy Spirit in Scripture so I bless you today in Jesus name I bless you today in Jesus name amen <laughs> I'm um, I'm trying to function here I have to finish this and um, <laughs> I mean God is just moving holy cow and moving in and through you I mean I just honor this time and you listening and um, I just want to encourage those of you listening to get her book um, that you can go to it's your website kimmoss.com you can go to findingourmuchness.com uh, you can go to bakerbookhouse.com or amazon it's, it's all over those places and I'm going to just spell her name so it's www.kimmaas there's two a's in it dot com um, and you can check her out on Instagram and Facebook as well. She's on social media. Um, thank you so much, Kim. This was thank a great you. honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. What a privilege. <laughs>